Well, hello. If you're in the lobby, please come in because it seems like there's so few of us in here, we would sure like a few extra people <clears throat> coming from graduation parties. I had several call me today and say they were out at graduation parties and would either be here or be here late. Or there. I told you, Robert, I said, I'm going to say, welcome, Robert and Lisa Iwanek. <laughs> You guys did good. Way to go. You had like six graduation parties today, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So it's been, I know it's a crazy weekend for everybody. School is winding down. Uh, oh gosh, there were a lot of people just hanging out in the lobby. So that's good too. So welcome. We've been doing this 50 days of Easter where we're just spending time celebrating Easter, extending the vacation. Nobody gave me a mega hat, a make Easter great again hat, and I'm disappointed that nobody gave me one of those. You can still do that. <laughs> On the uh, liturgical church calendar, if you're part of more of a formal type church, they do a 50 days of Easter type thing every year, and it basically goes from, you know, Good Friday all the way through to Pentecost. Today being the 50th day, they would be celebrate. well, tomorrow on Sunday, they would be doing Pentecost. We did it last week because for me, as powerful and as important as Pentecost is, It didn't seem like the right place to end our 50 days of Easter. Last week, we ended with Acts chapter 2. God's spirit has arrived. He's come to rest on the disciples. They start speaking in tongues. There's all this commotion. After it's determined that the disciples were, in fact, not drunk, because Peter says it's much too early for that, which means they have some sort of problem, I think. But then Peter proceeds to preach the gospel, and it's beautiful, and it's amazing. And then we're told in verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to this word, the church, that day. About 3,000 all. That's the first time in Scripture we see the word church. All barriers between humanity within the church are supposed to be torn down. All barriers through Christ between us and God are torn down. All barriers between races, all barriers between nations. There's no ranking, there's no hierarchy. As Christians, we're all sons and daughters of God. And so tonight, what we're doing and what I've called this is an Easter do-over. And so it's going to be kind of like an Easter or a Christmas service. It's going to be a little bit different. And what I want us to do is to take that story from Easter to the church and through words and teaching, through music, through the Lord's Supper, through a time of prayer, we just walk that path together tonight. And so I want this to, to not just be a typical service, but a night of celebration a night of refreshment, and a night of being the church here together. So won't you stand? We're going to start tonight by celebrating in song the church and God's amazing grace. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your might. Heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation back, change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set your hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captive hearts released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay 
lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church. We pray revive this earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Unleash your kingdom's power, reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire, win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here, we pray. Amazing grace, how sweet the 
Yeah, they deserve the applause because I put them through a lot with the songs tonight. There's a whole lot of songs tonight, and they're not the easiest songs, and, and, uh, uh, but they did amazing during rehearsal. So appreciate everybody's patience with the band, and thank you for all that tonight. That song that we just sang, Amazing Grace, writer of that song is a guy named John Newton. He's late 18th century is, is when he was coming of age. He's kind of got an interesting story. If you don't know it, he, was, uh, he went to work at a very young age as a, in the sea business, kind of on ships. The ships happened to be slave ships. And once, while he was working on these slave ships, he was actually captured himself and made a slave. It appears he didn't get along with these other crewmates. They left him behind on one of these islands, and the princess there actually made him a slave for a period of time. Eventually, he was rescued. And during this time, as he's rescued and going through all these trials and tribulations, he begins to read the Bible. And eventually, he converts to Christianity. And then after his conversion, though, he continues to invest and work in the slave trading business, uh, working in it for a period of time and then retiring, but continuing to be an investor in slave ships. But he continues to read God's word, he continues to study, and he allows the spirit then to transform him. And some 30 years go by, and eventually, he not only stops doing that, but he becomes an abolitionist. He starts to fight against slave trading in England. In a pamphlet he wrote, he wrote this, he says, A confession which comes too late, it will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, if you don't know where that comes from. Later on in life, John Newton, he loved his wife. Her name was Mary. <clears throat> and as is the case for many of us, when we lose someone, it can be the greatest test of our faith. And John, he had always prayed that he would die first. I know a lot of you in, in marriages, you probably have that thing, like, God, please take me first because I don't want to live without this person. I told my wife, Karen, who has to basically dress me every day because I can't match anything, I said, you got to go, I got to go first because I can't dress myself if you weren't here and it would be a disaster. So, so I got to go first. Well, John's prayers weren't answered. His wife did pass away first and it was traumatic. Yet somehow on the day she died... He found the strength, it was a Sunday, he found the strength to go to his church and preach that Sunday morning. The topic, you guessed it, it was grace. And he wrote, his grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The next day, John even went and visited his church members, he fed some sheep, he officiated his wife's funeral, which I can't even imagine officiating your own wife's funeral. He grieved, of course, but he knew that God's grace doesn't just save a wretch like me, that it can sustain a wretch like me too. So what if we actually believed that? What if we actually believed the story of Easter? Believed it 100%. What if we viewed life, every aspect, every encounter through that lens of sustaining grace? See, if we could take that filter and apply it not just to our sin, which it takes care of, but to every relationship we have, every success we have, we apply grace. Every failure we have, we apply grace. Every day, being reminded that there is nothing we can do to make God love us any more than he already does, and there's nothing we can do to make God love us any less than he already loves us. That's true for us, but it's also true for everybody we encounter who is in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, it's the best biblical definition of grace I can give you. Verse 8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Sociologists have a theory called the looking glass self. Basically it is that you become what the most important person in your life thinks of you. And so whatever your wife thinks of you is what you become. Whatever a parent thinks of you or a boss thinks of you or a thousand Facebook friends think of you, the, whatever the most important person in your life is, that's what you become. It's the looking glass theory. If we took that to Christ, how would our lives be transformed if we could look in the mirror and see how God sees us? 
How would your relationships be transformed if, if you could see everyone you meet the way that Jesus sees them? Romans chapter 3, verse 24 says, Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. Grace is a free gift. We're undeserving of grace, but that's because the gift bearer bore the cost. It's free to us, not free to him. And so remember several weeks ago, we looked at the Last Supper, and Jesus is there, and he's, he's trying to convey this, this cost to the disciples. And he doesn't use a lecture. He just uses a simple meal. He says in Luke 22, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before you suffer, before I suffer. And remember, this isn't a regular Passover meal. Jesus takes it way off script when he says, he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20 says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. He's trying to relay the cost. Jesus is saying, God's wrath is coming, just like it did at the first Passover. Only this time, no amount of blood from little Fluffy or Muffy is going to allow death to pass over you. The chasm is too deep, it's too wide. This time you need a different kind of lamb. I am that lamb. I'm the lamb whose blood will cover not just your doorpost, but the doorpost of your life. I'm the substitute. I'm the payment for your debt. And so then after this meal that Jesus has with his disciples, he goes then to a garden to pray to his father. And there in that garden, he's shown the cost. He's shown the cup. He's shown the depths of that chasm between us and God. He's shown God's full wrath and the depth, or his depth of his suffering. And then once on the cross, there wasn't going to be any turning back, but he had one last moment where he can still leave and save himself. But remember what he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Of course, Jesus is arrested. He's beaten. He's mocked. He's abandoned by his friends. He's betrayed by those closest to him. He's placed on a criminal's cross, and there the blood of the lamb is poured out. Person by person, sin by sin, death by death. So how would your life be transformed if you could see Jesus in that moment and the love that he must be feeling for you? How would it work if in your darkest moments, how would that sustain you through your trials and suffering? If you could see in the mirror what Jesus saw in you from the cross. If you could see in others what Jesus saw in them from the cross. What if we saw every day as our Easter do-over, a chance to celebrate God's amazing grace, a chance to give thanks to Jesus for the cost he paid? I've always wondered what the disciples were going through the day between Good Friday and Easter, that Saturday in between. Their friend is gone they're feeling guilty because they abandoned him. They're feeling embarrassed. Their hopes and dreams have been deflated. But I've always envisioned them, you know, in that upper room, kind of remembering that strange Passover meal. I'm like, what, what did Jesus do? And Thomas says, well, he got some wine, and he goes and gets some wine. And Peter, Peter says, we got a stale loaf of bread over here, and he gets it. And they bring it together. They're the disciples, the 11 of them, hiding, scared to death in the upper room. They're sobbing. They're crying. And they take the emblems, and they eat them, and they give thanks. So I thought it would be appropriate as we celebrate Easter again that we do that together tonight. So we have some servers, I think, that are going to hand those out or they've been handed out. Somebody uh, tell me what we're doing there. Yes, they're being handed out. They're going to pass out those emblems. And when, they, when you receive them, you can open them up. You can eat them as you receive them. You can drink the juice as you receive them just at your own time. And after you do that, go ahead and stand up. We're going to sing a song of thanks together tonight.
was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated. The breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time. I Took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood. seated.
Last night, several of us actually in this room, because I saw you come in, uh, attended a graduation. It was my oldest daughter's graduation. Uh, at the graduation is what you would expect. Diplomas were passed out. Speeches were given. Uh, I was surprised. No tears were shed, at least on my end. I think those tears will come as we go leave our baby girl away in Indiana. Um, but, but it was okay last night. It was my first Florida graduation. I hadn't been to a graduation in Florida. It's pretty much the same as it was where I came from. They wear caps and gowns, which is still a weird thing. I'm not sure why we put those on. Uh, they gave speeches, and they did a great job with the speeches from the valedictorian. At the end, you know, they throw their hats up in the air and lose them or whatever happens with the hats after that. One thing I noticed is you find out whose parents are the extroverts and whose are the introverts. Because, you know, the, the introverts were like, yay, Kennedy, good job. And the extroverts are like, whoop, whoop. It's like Arsenio Hall rolled up in there for their, for their kids' graduation. Uh, now, the graduation means we usually think of it as the end of something. It's the completion. But some people, rightly so, refer to the event that we went to last night as a commencement, which I like a lot better because it's not just the end of something. It's the commencement. It's the inception. It's the beginning of something new. I learned this week, if you go back in medieval times, which is apparently where the caps and gowns came from, a person would get a degree from whatever school they went to. And when they got that degree, it meant they were qualified to now instruct others in the academic discipline they studied. And as a part of the commencement ceremony, the new scholar would actually stand up in front of his peers and give his first legitimate lecture as a teacher of that field. In other words, at the commencement, they would commence doing what they had been prepared to do. Let's go back to Ephesians 2, that verse on grace. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. But then there's verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's saving grace. It's what moved us from death to life. That's our graduation from being a sinner. We throw our hats up into the air, and they come down, we're saints. Praise the Lord. You know those kids who go back to visit high school after they graduate? <laughs> That's not cool, kids. Don't, don't do a lot of that. It's time to move on. When you graduate, move on. Stop reliving the glory days. God's sustaining grace then empowers us after we're saved to move on, to begin a new work that says God has prepared for us in advance to do. 2 Corinthians 12, Paul writes, There was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan is what he calls it, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. We were at a graduation party last Sunday night. Uh, Nathaniel Riley, who you saw up here the other day, his younger brother, Patrick Riley, I learned, got a splinter in his foot at an unplugged camp that the school went to. Uh, at the camp, apparently, they proceeded to pull that splinter out, but apparently, they didn't get it all. And so, for like weeks, he was just walking around complaining about the splinter that was stuck into his foot. Uh, his dad probably ignored him, I'm guessing, and said, rub some dirt on it. But eventually, they went to get it pulled out and realized there was still a huge thorn in his foot that had to be removed. A lot of us walk around like Paul with a thorn in our side or like Patrick with a splinter in our toe. With every step, because of that thorn or because of that splinter, a reminder of that thing causing us pain. The cancer in our body. The grief or the regret or the guilt that's still in our hearts. That red ink in our checkbooks that felony that's still on our record, that craving for whiskey in the middle of the day, the tears in the middle of the night, that thorn tormenting us. Every step, a reminder of how broke we are, that person that's missing from our lives, our past mistakes. God says, no, my sustaining grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect, not in your strength, but in your weakness. Paul says again in 2 Corinthians 9, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound 
in every good work. After the resurrection, Jesus comes back. He starts talking about these good works. He begins to illustrate the sustaining grace. Remember, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Every good work, then feed my sheep. It's beautiful because within that question, it's actually a commencement ceremony for Peter. It's Jesus both forgiving him on one hand and then commissioning him to go do the good work on the other. Remember back to Acts 1.8, it says, And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The saving grace in that is God makes us his witnesses. He gives us an identity. We belong to him. It can't be taken away. That is saving grace. The sustaining grace is that every word, every action, every sharing about our scars and our thorns, every overflow of joy is a witness of Christ. Talk about another kid who's not, I don't think he's here tonight, your brother, Lucas. He had a graduation party today because he graduated last night as well. He's the chaplain at the school. I thought it was kind of funny. He had to do like a, they had all the juniors come up to the stage and, and he had to do like a little like ceremony to welcome the juniors to be the new seniors of the high school after the kids had graduated. And he said, he said, you'll have senioritis. That's not all bad. And I like that line, you'll have senioritis, you all know what that is, where you're just tired, you're ready to get out. You'll have senioritis, but it's not all bad. As Christians, man, we ought to be walking through life in a state of constant senioritis. Because we know that this world is not our home. We know that there is something better waiting for us. And so there should be this longing, there should be a, a wanting to get away of our old childish ways. Which then grants us the freedom to take risks. And allow God to use us. In our first Easter service, the 1.0 version of our celebration of Easter, we looked at three places. The garden, the cross, and the empty tomb. There's another place in the story that actually recurs more than any of the other places in the story. And I touched on it earlier. It's from Luke 22, verse 8. It says, Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go make preparations for us to eat the Passover meal. Where do you want us to prepare it, they ask. Verse 10, he says, he replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. This room upstairs, we call it the upper room. Every house had an upper room. That's how they built their houses back then. There's nothing special about this room. It's an ordinary, plain, simple room. But Jesus took the ordinary, he took the simple room, and he made it the place where he held the Last Supper. He made it the place where the old covenant became the new covenant. He made it the place where this beautiful lesson illustrated by the washing of the disciples' feet Likely that Saturday when the disciples were held up after the crucifixion, they were back there in that upper room. We know it was in that upper room where Jesus revealed his resurrected body to the disciples. It's where Jesus showed Thomas the nail prints in his hand. It's in that upper room last week where the disciples gathered after the ascension to celebrate Pentecost. And in that upper room where the Spirit of God descended upon them. Simple, basic room. When we move from life to death, move from death to life, that would be more (laughs) appropriate. We move from death to life, we graduate from the old and we commence the new. The new. No matter how unprepared you are, no matter how unqualified you are, no matter your lack of knowledge, your lack of skills, your lack of abilities, God's sustaining grace can use us. Not in spite of our weaknesses, but scripture says God can use us because of our weaknesses. The writers of Hebrews said it like this. He says, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I just want to take a time tonight to be a church. And one thing that a church does is we pray together. And so I just ask you now if you would bow your heads, and we just want to have a time of prayer. And I don't know how God is using you right now, or how he wants to be using you, and you're ignoring it, or maybe it's your weaknesses that you have and think that God can't use you because of your weaknesses. Just take a minute and reflect upon that, and talk to your Lord and Savior about that.
Let's pray. come to you tonight. God, we thank you for that saving grace that changed us from wretches to saints. We thank you that you look at us and you see us as sons and daughters, that you have an amazing inheritance waiting for us. And so God, give us senioritis that we know that this place, we're not going to be here much longer. There's something so much better waiting for us in glory. God, I just ask you tonight to use the members of this church and everybody who's here to use us, to use our weaknesses, to use those thorns, to use our scars, to be spreaders of the gospel, to be witnesses of your kingdom, to feed each other. God, we thank you so much for that grace and mercy. We pray tonight that you make us your upper room in Jesus' name. Amen. Won't you stand?
can be seated, church. The church in the decades before and after Jesus' life, all around that time period, there were these just multiple messianic movements in Israel. It was just the end thing for some new Messiah to rise up and, you know, claim that he was the chosen one. And in every case, or almost every case, the leader of those movements were killed by execution. So our religion really isn't any different than some of these other movements that were happening there. And then after the leader's death, though, each of those movements, they collapsed. Didn't work out. Everybody went home. That's the end. Of all those movements, only one didn't collapse after the death of its leader. And not only did Christianity not collapse, it exploded. Verse 41 in Acts 2 says, Those who believed what Peter said about their Messiah, about their Savior, were baptized and added to the church that day. About 3,000 in all. 
the church begins. 3,000 new converts. They're meeting in homes. They're gathering. And over the next 300 years, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, would spread throughout that empire in Rome. And the church would eventually become powerful, which isn't always a good thing. Kennedy, uh, we had her graduation party last Sunday, and to prepare for that graduation party, Karen wanted me to make a slideshow, and it was a fun trip down memory lane, looking at all these old photos, and, you know, technology has changed. When she was born, we had to actually pull out a, we had a digital camera, but you had to pull it out and actually use a camera. You couldn't just whip your phone out of your pocket. So it's funny to watch the pictures change and, and to look at all those memories over 17 plus years, and as we looked at those memories, it was all smiles and rainbows. You know, we didn't remember the bad stuff so much. We didn't remember those baby stage nights. There's no pictures of us up at 3 a.m. throwing her out the door. There's no picture of us when (laughs) you think I'm joking. (laughs) There's no pictures, Justin, of the toddler stage. Man, I saw you all here last Wednesday chasing trip around this place. We, I mean, that's hard, but we just saw the cute smiles and, you know, that's what the pictures are. There's certainly, I think there was a picture of her learning to drive, but the fear certainly didn't come through in the picture. We can look back at the history, the 2,000-year-old history of the church, and we can look at it two ways, and I've looked at it both of these ways. One of the ways is just be really critical of the church. Only see the failures, and there are many to see, and so we look back, and all the photos we see are just the mistakes, the mess-ups, the, the bad stuff the church has done. Or we can go the opposite direction. We can look back at pictures of the church, and it's all rainbows and sunshine, the glorious church. The church was, and the church is, and the church always will be a place filled with people who were once blind, but now they see. Filled with people who were once lost, but now they're found, filled with people who were once dead, and now they're alive. That's the pattern that grace follows. It's the was, but now. And when you take people, though, who were used to being blind, and all of a sudden they can see, there's a bit of a learning curve to being able to see. There's even a bigger learning curve when you take people who were dead, and now they have to learn how to live. And so the history of the church is going to have some spots. It's going to have some blemishes. Modern congregations like ours, it's going to have some trials and some difficulties because it's made up of us misfits. Recently, I started re-watching ER. Anybody remember that TV show? It actually holds up pretty well. For a show made in the early 90s through late 90s, I mean, Dr. Green, Benton, Carter, they, I mean, it, it, it held up pretty well. Um, what's the thing they always say? Do you remember what they always kind of said throughout the show? That this ER is a teaching hospital. This is a teaching hospital. Mark chapter 2, verse 16 it says, but when the teachers of religious law were Pharisees, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and other sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? Nice thing to say. Verse 17, when Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. And we take from that this popular phrase that no doubt probably everybody in the room has heard, the church is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. And so I've always thought of refuge as kind of a teaching hospital. We're like the ER, because most of us here, we don't really know what we're doing. So even the doctors here are, are learning on the job. The nurses are learning on the job. And so we bring in patients, and we fix them up, and we bandage them, and we improve them, and we heal them. And the problem with that general line of thinking, and thinking of the church as a hospital, we can start to think that the church's job is to fix us. That somehow, if we stay in the church long enough, we can pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we can get ourselves well. That if we try hard enough to get better, we can live our best life now. I think there's a better analogy for the church. I propose tonight that we begin to think of this little church here called Refuge and the greater church, the church, in a different light. Not a hospital for sinners, but a morgue for the dead. But it's a different kind of morgue. It's a very strange morgue. It's a morgue where people arrive dead as a doornail, and then they leave alive. See, the Bible never says we're sick or broken. It says we're dead doesn't say we're simply victims of sin that need healing. The Bible says when we're outside of Christ, we are actually enemies of God. 
Jesus didn't come to fix the world. He didn't come to fix us. He came to kill us and raise us up just as he rose up from the empty tomb. Paul says this in Romans 6. He says, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may have new lives. God doesn't look at the church as a bunch of patients in various stages of our improvement. He sees us as sons and daughters who were once lost, but now we're found. Who were once dead, but now we're alive in the greatest way possible. And so the church, instead of just being filled with doctors and nurses, and we should act like doctors and nurses and take care of each other and bandage up each other's wounds, there needs to be plenty of that happening in the church. More than that, church is a place where those of us with senioritis can speak life to dead, dry bones. So why don't you stand one more time tonight as we proclaim that.
One more time. <laughs> now for the real sermon. <laughs> Go ahead and turn the house lights on, Jessica, if you would, the back ones there. That's the end of our 50 days of Easter do-over. I hope it was refreshing. I hope it was a good time of celebration. You need to remember that every day is an Easter do-over. Every minute is an Easter do-over. That sustaining grace will carry you through. But let's get to where I wanted to get to. It's Acts chapter 2. It's the ending. And we get a glimpse of the inner workings of the very first church. It says, it's right out here in the lobby. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the sharing and meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions. They shared the money with with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, shared meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being moved from death to life. Worshiping God, teaching fellowship, sharing meals, Lord's Supper, prayer, meeting together, sharing everything. I hope we do that, guys, as a church. We're coming into summertime. I leave for vacation tomorrow. I'm headed to Hawaii. I need a break, y'all. And so I can't wait to get out of town and take it easy. A friend posted on Facebook this week. He says, most people don't want to be a part of the process. They just want to be a part of the outcome. It's true, right? We don't want to be a part of the process. We just want to be a celebration at the end, the outcome. That's a lot of us. And especially we get to summer, it's like church, eh, that we'll get back to that in the fall. And, and I don't want to do that. But I know everybody's gone and they're traveling. I'm gone and traveling. But I want to challenge us as a church not to just take the summer off, but to go deeper this summer. It may not look like it always looks, but I want to challenge you that we have three pillars as a church, deep study, deep relationships, and deep serving. And so every week, I just want to challenge us to go deeper in different ways. I'm going to leave this slide up on the screen here when you leave tonight. If you want to swing by and take a picture of it, um, it's just got our upcoming schedule. I'll post it to Facebook tonight so you can kind of see the upcoming schedule. We've been talking about for several weeks on 529, which is next weekend, Memorial Day weekend, uh, instead of gathering in this place in this format, we're going to encourage you to gather in your homes with each other. And a few people have offered for us to use their homes, but we don't know how that's all going to shake out. We don't want, you know, 50 people over here and 10 people over here. So what we ask you to do, Tanya's going to put a thing on Facebook, and you can just kind of sign up there and say, I want to do this, and she'll just assign you to the home that's closest to you. If you don't have Facebook or you just want to get it done and taken care of to make sure you do it, uh, out in the lobby after the service, somebody will be out there with a sheet of paper and you can sign up saying, yes, I want to be a part of it. Here's my phone number. And Tanya will reach out to you later this week and say, hey, this Saturday you're here in Fort Myers or you're there in Cape Coral or whatever. But man, I encourage you to do that. I know it's, it's different and challenging, but look, you can't have relationships that are deep unless you actually get with people and spend time with them. So I want to encourage you to do that. On June the 5th, the very next week, while I'm out of town, Dwayne Jackson is going to be preaching and he's going to take us deep into God's word and he's going to be talking about what else but the church and how the church functions at a, as a body. On 6-12, the week after that, I'm at a wedding, I'm up in Indiana, uh, but we're going to do a deep service night here as a church and I think what it's going to look like, we're working out the details, is we'll come in here, we'll have a time of worship and then we're going to just serve together as a church, whatever that looks like. It may be a project right here in the building that we can do, we have some ideas, or maybe we do it around the building or whatever, but it'll be a time of singing and worship and then also a time of, of serving deeply 
this community. I'll be back on 619, and I think the series I want to go to is Deep Questions. I just want to spend the summer challenge you with deep questions, and, and if you have a question that you've thought about, and you're like, I just don't know the answer to this, I've been too scared to ask, ask me, and we can make that a sermon for that night. We'll go to God's Word, and we we'll see what it says about it, but, but the deep questions, whatever those deep questions that others are afraid to touch, we're not afraid. We'll touch them, we'll talk about them, we'll see where that goes. Thanks for being here tonight. I do hope you feel refreshed, you feel alive. God bless. Love you all. I won't see you next week, but see you in a few. See you next time.